and I'm joined by the one and only Mr. Crusher Joe. How are you keeping, pal? I'm alive. Hey. I'm lively. Yeah, no, I'm doing good, mate. I'm doing good considering the circumstances. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, mate. Well, as, as I said to you uh, just before we start recording, uh, with this one we're going to do a bit of a takeover show. So basically, we're just going to play any bands that we happen to mention while we chat for for the next few minutes, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. So I thought I would take it all the way back to the beginning, mate, because it always interests me how people get started. What was the first band that you know really grabbed hold of you, where you thought, "Well, hang on, what's this? This is this is different." Uh, well, there were three, to be quite honest. Uh, the first one that I heard on the radio, uh, which fucked me, it was in the, the late 60s, was a band called Love Sculpture. Oh. And they had a single uh, called Sabre, Sabre Dance, um, which was... Um, it was their interpretation of a classical piece by a guy called Kachaturian. Um, and it was, it, I think, I think they were a three piece. And they used to have, uh, it was Dave Edmonds. You, you probably never heard of Dave Edmonds. But Dave Edmonds was a legend back then. And uh, he, he, he he had some, some hits and he was involved in lots of things. But anyway, I heard that on the radio. Uh, I think it was like I used to sit in the bath listening to the, uh, the uh, I think it was the top 20 oh. back. Um, and uh, it, it made the charts. I can't remember how high. I think it got quite high. And I just remember it coming on and thinking, and also it was long. It was a long single. And I was thinking, fucking hell, that's, that's, that's definitely different. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I tried to find out a bit about it. It was very difficult back then because you didn't have Google. Of but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, you know, I, in Melody Maker or whatever it was, uh, I, yeah, I found out, you know, a bit about them. Uh, I never managed to get lo see love, um, love sculpture, but I did manage to see Dave Edmonds, uh, Dave Edmonds band when I was at uh, Hereford College of Art because he's a local boy. I think he lives in Wales. Oh, right. There's a lot to do with that. Uh, um, Rockville Studios oh, again. Yeah. You, well, you know every every great album in the seventies was made at Rockfield. But yeah, Dave Edmonds, he was a very very important part. Of what, as I say, that was that was it. That's that kind of turned me on to uh, to to rock. And it's it, it, it's you know what you listen to that single, and uh, it's kind of like uh, it's almost like thrash metal. You know, it's it's really fast. It's a really fast piece of music. Um, just guitar, bass, and drums. No vo no vocals. You know. Yeah. And then there were two bands that I, I then started going to Malvern Winter Gardens when uh, uh, I think I was a little bit older. And there were two bands I saw there. One was or uh, well, three actually. It was Taste and Deep Purple. Nice. Was the first was the first night. Uh, and I came away thinking, fuck me, I'd like to be involved in this industry. But the second one was, a, uh, that was that was September 1969, Taste in Deep Purple. Oh, wow. And then on May the 30th, 1970, shortly after they'd released their first album, uh, I saw Black Sabbath. Oh, nice. Headline, Marvel Winter Gardens. And that was it. I remember sitting in my dad's car because, you know, it was in the middle of, I lived in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. They had to come and pick me up after the gig and sitting there thinking, yeah, I don't know what, how, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, but mm. I want to be involved in the music industry. And that's that's how it, that's how it all started. No, oh, nice, man. Obviously, like you. And uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, don't go back. To... Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say it was obviously, Elena, you're, we know you you for your art. Were you always play like drawing and painting as a kid or did that come later on? No, I was always drawing and painting as a kid. I loved comics, uh, you know, even, even going back to uh, when I was, uh, you know, next to nothing. I remember being bought a comic called Play Hour, and I loved that. And then, obviously, uh, I guess it was, early, yeah, I must have been about nine or ten years old. Um 
or maybe maybe even younger than that, to be honest. Uh, but I remember going to Kidderminster Town Hall with my mum, and they had a stall there which sold um, second-hand comics. Oh. And, you know, magazines and books and that. And I remember, you know, I, I had in my hands the first Fantastic Four, the first Spider-Man, the first Hulk. Wow. But what, and what I didn't realise was, you know, I should have kept those and put them in a drawer and uh, never let daylight see, you know, let them see daylight. But what you could do is take them back and part exchange them. For, uh, and that's what I did. But yeah, I got very much into Marvel and DC comics. And I remember drawing those as a, as a kid. Um, and then, I mean, I, when I was at, I went to grammar school and I was bloody useless at everything uh, apart from art. Uh, and uh, I mean, I failed all my O-levels, including art, which that was the one that gutted me. But I'd been, it didn't matter because I'd been accepted by Herefordshire College of Art on a two-year foundation course. And uh, yeah, that's where, you know, those two years I learned more there than I learned any anywhere else because I, I went on to uh, Goldsmiths yeah. London University after that uh, did a three year course which they failed me uh, but yeah I mean fuck I've been at more than two years foundation at Hereford than the three years I was at Goldsmiths wow yeah. Yeah. how did you find Goldsmiths because obviously that's a pretty prestigious art. Uh, I, I, I uh, it was like a it had its good, its ups and its downs. I mean, I enjoyed myself there to a degree, but I found that I was being force-fed ideas by the tutors. Mm. That you know, I wasn't. I wanted to do my own art, you know, and uh, but they were going, "Oh, have you seen? Have you looked at this? Have you looked at that?" And I say, "Oh, yeah, but you know, I'm not really interested in that." But yeah, I, it, it's, it's, it's at the end of the day, you know, they failed me. Um, I did some great stuff there. I painted a painting called Fuck Art, Let's Dance. Google it, right? I've never made a penny out of it. They should have given me a fucking honours degree uh, just just for that one fucking painting alone. But yeah, Google Fuck Art, Let's Dance. It's uh, it's quite an interesting. Inter it's, well, you know, it's the first time, you know, first time I got ripped off on anything. And uh, it continued for the rest of my fucking life. <laughs> I'm always interested because, um, like for me, like um, I was during lockdown, I got back into you know collecting vinyl and everything, and you know I I inherited a lot of my dad's vinyl and stuff, and more looking at the sort of album artworks. Obviously, you you created a lot of album artwork yourself, but was there any albums where you growing up when you saw the artwork that you were sort of you know mesmerized by, sort of thought they were stood above? Um, the early ones, yes. There was one by 10 years after called Shh. Uh, that had an amazing cover. Uh, the early Pink Floyd covers uh, I loved. Um, there, was a, there was a compilation album called Gut Bucket, which had a picture of some pigs on it, which oh, was I brilliant. And uh, also I remember Uriah Heaps. Was it I'm a gut? No, no, I'm a gut. Um, it, had, I, it had that a demon on the, on the cover. I can't remember what it was fucking called, but that was a great cover. But uh, yeah, and, and also, you know, in Crimson, no. uh, Court of the Crimson King. I mean, that was, a, I mean, that was a cover and a half. But yeah, there, there, there were quite a lot of, uh, and I, although I, I didn't particularly like the band at that time, I loved all the Great From Dead covers. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah there's there's a a lot a lot around um traffic there's a band called traffic dear mr fantasy that was a great cover but yeah there's yeah yeah i was so you know there was definitely a lot of well covers back then you know you could pick it up and, yeah have a proper look at it yeah yeah look at it and you know if it was a gatefold fucking result you know and if it had if it had in a, in a sleeve 
with lyrics and stuff on, you know, even more. Yeah. You know, but I mean, you know, stuff like, um, well, Sergeant Peppers, you know, they had all the freebies in it. But any old, a lot of the Beatles, the Beatles White album came with a lot of goodies in it. But yeah, yeah. But the cover of the Beatles White album, I mean, that was brilliant. Oh, yeah. you know, it was just, <laughs> just white, white album with a, with a number on it. Uh, an embossed number yeah but yeah so how did you go from studying art to you know starting to starting off your own career well funny enough when they failed me at goldsmiths mm. um the first job i applied for was working for the local newspaper the south southeast london and kentish mercury mm. uh, they were looking for someone to work in their design de department uh actually designing adverts to go in to uh into the, the the newspaper for you know local businesses and stuff um who didn't have the the money to have a, an advertising agency do their ads mm. and so yeah i went from like fine art to graphic art fairly quickly and yeah i got the job mm -hmm. and uh, I, I basically bullshitted my way in and very quickly learned how to do graphic design, which of course came in brilliantly when I started to do do album covers. But yeah, I did the. Uh, I forgot how long I was at um, South East London Kids, probably a year or so. And then I had a girlfriend whose father said he would set me up as a freelancer. He said, "Look, I'll get you an office," which he did in. Um, what was it? I think it was Campbell High Street or somewhere. And oh. uh, uh, basically, he, get, he I mean, he, he worked for. He, he did many things. He's a dodgy South East London geezer, but he worked for Total Oil. Uh, yeah. You know, respectable uh, uh, job. But he also has worked in the boxing fraternity, oh. uh, which was quite fucking frightening. And uh, yeah, he, he gave me some. You know, he got me this this office, set me up, got me a, uh, bought me a, you know, a drawing board and all this stuff, and then he gave me some jobs for Total Oil just to get my foot in the door and earn some money, and then basically I just went round because uh, I told him I wanted to work in the music industry. He said, "Yeah, that's fine," and yeah. I just went round with my portfolio going round um, uh, the. The major record companies and none of them you know were in this this was uh 76 76 77 and none of them were interested but there were by then there were loads of little independent and uh the first one that uh gave me a job was a um a label called the label right which was actually uh, run by two very dodgy guys, both of them called Tony, I believe, and also had uh, by a guy called Dave Goodman, who was the original producer of the Sex Pistols. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And the very first single that I did, it was for an EP by a band called Eater. And the EP was called Get Your Yo-Yos Out. And uh, I think it was a live EP, um, and there there was a punk band, yeah. and their claim to fame was that their drummer, whose name was Degenerate, was twelve years old, um, <laughs> and they, they had quite a, a bit, bit of success on the back of that. But then the second, uh, which was my proper, because that was an EP. The first single that I did was for, for Dave, Dave Goodman. Uh, it was a single called Justifiable Homicide. Um, and it had uh, it had both Steve Jones and Paul Cook from the Sex oh, Pistols okay. playing on it. But because of contractual reasons, um, we had to take their name off the, uh, off the sleeve. Uh, but I've got some of the printer's proofs with their their names on it that's cool. and i've also got which you know for sex pistol fans that's probably i could sell that for a few but i've also got the original artwork so you know 
that's that's a good thing. But yeah, that's basically how I got started. Yeah, that's nice one, man. So when did you start going? Obviously, you were doing the art work, and then you ended up being art director at Kerrang for a good few years. Yeah, well, we, what happened with the once I got started doing, I did quite a bit for the label. Mm. Uh, there was a, f a couple of other punk bands that I think I did some stuff for. There was a they had a reggae band called Tribesmen. I did quite a lot of stuff for Tribesmen as well. But it started to, you know, I then started to get stuff yeah. in my portfolio that was, uh, you know, finished product that I could show to people. And uh, I remember what other, there were other labels I got, but but no, the big break came. And how the fuck did it come? Oh, yeah. No, right. No, this was another. There was a guy called Barney Bubbles. Now, Barney Bubbles was a genius designer, one of my heroes. And he did album covers for the likes of uh, early days. He did all the great Hawkwind album covers. Oh, cool. The real psychedelic ones, you know, mm. Master of Reality that folds out. He was a uh, genius behind uh, Hawkwind covers. And also he designed Oz Magazine. You're too young to understand. Oh, but Oz Magazine was an underground magazine. Very trick, very, very, you know, way fucking out there radical magazine um this and a lot of the design in there i i i incorporated incorporated on kerrang when i started doing kerrang but anyway what i did i phoned barney because uh, back then you could get the yellow page i was living in london obviously and he got the yellow pages and i just looked up barney bubbles and fuck me he's there in Covent Garden and I phoned him up, explained what I'd done and said, would you be interested in looking at my portfolio? And he said, yeah, of course. He, he was like, a little, he looked like a little fucking pixie. He, was, he really was a magical guy. Um, and I went round and he loved it. He loved my work. He was really, really positive about it. He said, look, what I'm doing is, uh, I think it was like either once a month or once a fortnight, he had these brainstorming sessions and basically he got five or six of us young designers who were just just starting out and what he would do is go around to his studio um smoke lots of dope drink some alcohol and then he'd talk about projects that he had and milk us for ideas for <laughs> it um which, you know, fair enough. Yeah. We loved it. But I also, you know, no, he taught us stuff as well. And eventually uh, that came to an end. He lost for about four or five, four or five sessions. And then one day I'm, I'm at my flat and my phone rings and it's Barney. And he goes, Look, I, I, I know from your portfolio that you've done some like holiday brochures and stuff like that. He said, would you be interested in doing a tour program? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. He said, he said it's only 24 pages. Um, very simple. You know, you, you have a few words, a lot of pictures, and just basically do the layout. I said, yeah, great. Who's it for? He goes, Blondie. Oh, nice. Right? And this was, I think it's 77. And it's when they did Blondie's Parallel Lines tour. It's when they fucking took off. Yeah, really took off. When they went fucking you know, Stella. And um, the company that I was doing the tour programme for was, um, I think they were called Grey, Grey Bray or something like that. Anyway, it was part of Motorhead's management. Oh, right, okay. And it was, uh, Doug Smith was the guy who was managing uh, Motorhead yeah. and Hawkwind. He was also back then, he was involved with, I know, Aerosmith and ZZ Top and stuff like that. Oh, cool. And there was a lot going on in that fucking office. Yeah, it sounds but like on it. the floor above his offices was his wife's 
which was the uh, merchandising woman. And when I went round to pick my check up uh, and a, a copy, a couple of copies of the, the tour programme from the portfolio, uh, she said, oh, my husband, Doug, wants to see you. Um, pop in when you're you're going out. And I did. She said, yeah, I, look, I love your programme. Uh, we've got this band called Motorhead. Uh, they're going out on the, it was for Overkill. Nice. Uh, you know, I said, um, we wanted to design the tour program for it. And it was because of that that I then did Overkill, Bomber, uh, Iron Fist, Another Perfect Day. I also did Hawkwind's 10th anniversary Levitation tour. Nice. I did girl school tour programs. I did a Sammy Hager, some stuff for Sammy Hager. I did Gamma. I did loads of stuff for them. And and again, just pure luck, being the right place at the right time, I walked in uh, to pick a check up again. And Finn Costello, the photographer, legendary oh. photographer, was there. And he'd seen some of the stuff that I was doing. And he said, look, I'm doing... Um, I'm working on a tour program for Rush. Are you interested? I said, absolutely. And that was Rush's uh, Words and Pictures Volume 2, which was their tour program for whatever tour that, that was. Uh, and through that, uh, Finn it was really pleased with it. And he said, look, look I'm not going to be working on Aussies. I, he did Aussies' first album. He said, I'm doing the second album. Would you like to come up with some ideas uh, for it? Which I did. And that was Diary of a Madman. Nice. Yeah. Nice one, man. Yeah. Can't get over that. That's crazy. It's nice how like, that sort of evolved. And obviously, I know you've had your ups and downs in terms of being ripped off, like you sort of touched upon earlier. But to be involved in those things at the time must have been Incredible. Yeah, you, you know what? Because by then things were actually going so well for me. I was I, I was really really busy, hmm. uh, and yeah, I knew it was like yeah, fuck it's Ozzy Osbourne, you know, fucking you know, one one of the guys in the band that I saw at Mole Wintergarden that made me want to get into this industry. But I was so busy, I didn't really have time to fucking sit down and think about how huge, uh, huge it was. I just got on with the job. And shortly after that is when I uh, phoned Karang up hmm. and said, again, you know, will you have a look at my portfolio? And uh, I saw Alan Lewis, the editor, in the pub. That was a great place to have a meeting. <laughs> and uh, it was just before Christmas and over several pints. Again, he loved what I was doing. And he said, will you go away and redesigned the mastheads and i don't even know what mastheads are but in a magazine you know where it says um news tours oh, yeah. singles albums you know it's where they have sections yeah. and it's basically just doing that you know designing head headings for for those those sections you know like uh singles albums for the charts and stuff yeah. like that and that's where i came up with that grand spiky lettering yeah. and he hadn't asked me to, to do the logo but off my own back I did the logo uh, and as I say that was he asked me before Christmas and I went in it must have been just after Christmas and this was 83 January 83 and he loved it he loved everything I put in front of him including the logo um, and he said look I'll be in touch and I think within two days, he called me and said, look, would you like to become an uh, art director wow. for Kareem? And I was like, yeah, that would be brilliant. But I want to do it on a freelance basis, you know, so I can come in and go whenever I fucking want. And he said, yeah, that's not, not a problem. And, uh, yeah, that was the uh, start of 10 years on Kareem, what I call the golden age, yeah. when it really was fucking special magazine. And all the, the bands, they just, you know, you know, you had bands like ZZ Top, Slayer, Metallica, Faith No More, Guns N' Roses, you know, even um, guys out of uh, Rainbow, and, and they, they, they would just fucking walk into the office, 
not because they were being interviewed, because yeah. they knew, you know, one, it was like fucking party central in there. <laughs> and and two, you know, they they didn't treat us as journalists. Well, I wasn't a journalist, but you know, they treated them as friends, you know. It was it was it was a wonderful time. And then, you know, fucking EMAP bought it. And the the shit set in. What pisses me off now is that the it's no longer with EMAP, but it's with um, some German company, and they've started using my logo again, which oh, I yeah. should should fucking find out. I've been meaning to, you know, Fiona Powell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been meaning to. Well, I have spoken to Fiona. Yeah. Uh, I spoke to her last year at Stone Dead. Uh, you know, saying I should really do something about that. She said, "Yes, you should." You know, I'll do a letter for you, but it, me being me, I never fucking follow anything up. So, but I will one day. <laughs> I didn't realise they started using it. I mean, I've I've not bought. I mean, I bought it as a teenager, and even then, that's way. Past. Yeah, no, they started publishing because they stopped stopped publishing it. Yeah, it went all online for a while. But it? no, they start start publishing again. I think it's about fucking fiber an issue. It's ridiculous. And I looked through it. And yeah, it looked great, the cover, but I looked through and it's like, fuck, you know, just your basic standard design, you know. Yeah. I mean, when I designed Kerrang, it was like, it was, you know, it was something to behold. I think that's the thing, like, like like you say, when you were doing it and when other artists were doing other things in that time, you know, there's some great sort of digital graphics designers at about, about the moment, don't get me wrong, but it's very easy to do stock stuff up just very quickly. Uh, for the yeah. there's no sort of you know it takes that that sort of human side about the actual artisan kind of side of it out. Yeah, no, no, you know, I, I, I met, it, it was it was a fucking art when I was designing Kerrang. You know, we had background tones and yeah, yeah, I loved it. It was great. I mean, I, again, because it was you know it, that time eighty three. Well, no, sort of, sort of from. 77 to 95 was so intense with work and pleasure that I didn't have a chance to sit back and and you know think about what's going on I just did it you just had you didn't have any choice you just fucking you know right one job's finished right going to the next oh there's a party tonight or there's a launch party for someone tonight or there's a gig tonight yeah 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 and you just went on and on and on and by 95 i was pretty burnt out to be honest yeah i bet yeah i was <laughs> i mean at one, point, at one point i was doing um i was doing art direction of kerrang which by then was a weekly magazine mm. I was doing a radio show for the BBC on their Greater London radio station, lo is local for London, uh, an hour show for them. I was doing the TV show, which back then was Power Hour. Uh, again, that was like once a week. And I was DJing at the Hippodrome on a Wednesday night, you know, to 1,800 kids every Wednesday. So that's that's what I was doing. That was my four jobs every week, you know. That's intense, and mate. It was intense. No wonder I took fucking drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Probably needed them just to power through, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I did. No, seriously. I mean, after the hippodrome, I wouldn't get home till four or five o'clock in the morning. I'd probably spend half my wages on cocaine. Uh, so that when I had to get up, at, uh, well, I had to be at the Krang office for between nine and ten. The next morning and you know i by the time i got home five o'clock i'd take the dog out you know then get a couple of hours sleep and then you're up fucking designing kerrang yeah it was it was mad fucking mad no wonder i'm fucked <laughs> <laughs> one thing i did want to ask you about was just because i was curious on your your opinion on it mate because there's been a lot of opinion flying around on it and I know, you know, the, the whole Pantera Union things. Obviously, I know you met the guys. You you got to oh, yeah. them and everything. I thought he was on tour with them for two and a half months. Wow. I mean... Yeah, nearly yeah. killed me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, Rex and Phil have got the, got the right to go out there like anyone else. But 
Um, I know people have different sort of opinions on it. It's just as someone who obviously, like, say, you've been on tour with them, you knew the guys pretty well at one point. I, I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm totally in agreement with it. I think it should have been done a long time ago. I know a long time ago that, uh, that were, uh, even in 2000, when I was on tour with them, that the, the love that they, because that came on a couple of times uh, and jammed with them. Uh, uh, and the love between Zach and, and Dimebag was intense. And, you know, it was like, yeah, if anything ever happened, Zach would be fucking perfect. You know, I never thought about Charlie for the drums, but, uh, yeah, it seems like he's, he's, he's fitting very well. And, and I mean, I've watched a couple of the videos. Jesus Christ. It looks like a force to be reckoned with, doesn't it? Look, oh, they, they're, they're just, it's... It's intense. It's brutal. It's in brutal and incredibly intense, just like it should be with Pantera. They're all playing brilliantly, although I'm a bit worried about Zach. I saw some pictures of him the other day. I mean, he's still looking fit as fuck. You know, his arms and that, but his face, it's really gaunt. He's really oh. thin. Yeah. He looks, you know, it's like sucked in cheeks and that. It's like fucking hell. But then again, you know, he's done the Pantera, or he's going to be doing more Pantera as well, and he's doing his Black Star, uh, sorry, um, Black Label Society at the moment. Uh, it probably, you know, stuff with Ozzy as well. It's, it's, well, he won't be doing anything live with Ozzy, but, uh, but yeah, you know, he's, he pushes himself as well. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm all, all in favour of Pantera, and I, I sincerely, I know that um, uh, European festivals are dropping them from yeah. the last having booked them uh, because of uh, Phil's stupid, drunken, racist rant. Yeah. Uh, but I can assure you that I spent a lot of time with Phil, and he is not, he is not a white supremacist, and he's most definitely not a racist. Uh, especially as the uh, girlfriend he had at the time when uh, we were on, I was on tour with him, uh, was a black lady. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, he's definitely not fucking racist. Uh, and it's a shame. It's a shame. No, he, you know, what he did was fucking stupid. It was, yeah, of course it was. Really, really stupid. But I think that all of that stuff had wound him up. And it was like, you know, I, I've done stupid things like that in the past. You know, when you're young, you do s some stupid things. But he was old enough to know better, uh, but obviously too drunk not to. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, it's something you'll, he'll, he'll regret for a long time. But, um, you know, I, I think. I think they're wrong. But I mean, in this politically correct fucking age we're in. You know, I'm surprised that fucking rock bands still exist. <laughs> well, I mean, for me personally, I was of the opinion when, when the reunion got announced. I mean, I was too young to have seen Pantera first time round. I saw Damage Plan just about. Um, I'd seen Down a couple of times. I've seen Down a few times, um, but never saw Pantera. My dad had been to see Pantera, and I was phenomenally jealous as a seven-year-old kid that he didn't take me. I was pissed off about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. he did take me to gigs when I got a bit older, but I think he thought, uh, yeah, maybe not take the seven-year-old to Pantera. So uh, probably a wise move on his part, to be fair. Um, but yeah, so for me, when it got announced, it was just like, I can't, you know, I'm hoping they come to the UK with it. Because I'd love to see them. I've it. been meaning to get in touch with Phil but um, and ask him if they are. But I I just, I, I just thought, fuck me, everybody's going to be fucking messaging him or emailing him. And, uh, you know, I, I'll let him have some peace. But I will, you know, uh, well, probably now is a good time because they're, they're, I think they're, they're resting before they start the next phase of the tour. But, yeah, I'm fingers crossed that they're coming to the UK. Um, I was hoping that they might be doing um, blood stop, but definitely, definitely not. I don't think they're doing... Um, I'm pretty sure they won't be doing down though. Mm -hmm. But then again, you never know. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. No, it'd be nice to see him over. Like I say, I've seen, you know, 
saw saw damage plan saw saw down. So I would really really love to see this in contact. Yeah. Itself. I've seen some videos online and it looks absolutely wicked. Oh god, yeah, yeah. I mean the crowd's just going fucking insane. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen crowds going that mad for for a long long time. That bigger crowd as well, you know. Some of the stuff, uh, what was it in Mexico they did, didn't they? Huge crowd fucking going ape shit. Crazy. Anyway. So speaking of bands, though, I mean, you're always into you, you're still discovering bands, mate. I mean, it was it was thanks to you and an album that you were pushing that I really started listening to Cats and Space Atlantis. Um, I'd sort of heard the name floating about and then didn't really listen to them too much until that Atlantis came out. But that was, you know, Dan, I saw a post of yourself and I thought, well, you know, if someone's that passionate about the album, I'll, I'll go give that a spin and listen. It's a great record. It is. You know, it's a nice. But to be honest, I don't listen to uh, anything. Yeah. That, the, only, the only reason that came about is because I put up one of my Crusher Norris on Facebook and Greg, uh, Greg Hart, the guitarist, the uh, songwriter yeah. with them, saw that I was wearing uh, my Skull and Crossbones uh, jumper and he messaged me saying oh we've got a a cats in space one which is very similar to your jumper and i said look this is a jumper i got given 20 odd years ago yeah. but i've got a t you know i've got a t-shirt my own t-shirt and i'll swap you one of my t-shirts from your cats in space t-shirt you know because i like a good skull and crossbones it's yeah. a cat with you know yeah. and it's uh had a pirate theme, I think, to it because of the Atlantis thing. And he sent sent me a promo copy of the Atlantis album, and I listened to it. Uh, and normally, if anybody sends me something, if I get through a minute of it, they've done well, mm. uh, because I don't want to sound fucking big headed or you know Simon Cowlish, but I've just heard it all. Or before, you know, I'm almost fucking 70 years old now. You know, I was there in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. I've seen every fucking band there is going. I've hung out with every band. I've seen every kind of phase of music. And all I hear nowadays is, you know, oh, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so, yeah, yeah. And it's very difficult to hear something that really, really turns me on. Um yeah, I'm just just an old miserable fucking kid. These <laughs> but no, Cats in Space did. Um, what did I? Uh, there's, there's something. There are bands around. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, is it Gajira? Or, yeah. Is it? yeah, yeah, yeah. I like them. Uh, occasionally, something seeps through, or someone says something. I go and listen to it. It's like, fuck yeah, that's good. That's really good. But yeah, I, I mean, I don't don't go out of my way. And people are, you know, saying, oh, can I send you my demo? And I'm like, well, you can, but you know, it probably won't last more than a minute on my death deck. But uh, no, I normally tell them not to. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, don't, because I hate it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I know that, that I know there must be loads of new bands out there that that are are great, you know. Uh, it's just that uh, I'm not, I, you know. As I say, I'm having done it, been there. Uh, I'm just not. I'm not even that interested in fucking music industry <laughs> anyway. No, I can understand that with the amount of times you've been ripped off by it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I like doing Bloodstock. I love doing Stone Dead. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's about it, you know. Um, people ask me, oh, you know, would you design our album cover? It's like, you know, that'd be so fucking ridiculous. Of course I wouldn't, you know. I don't, you know, having to deal with bands, you know, they say, oh, yeah, we want you to do, uh, do the cover. And I'm like, right, okay, if we do it, it's going to be, you know, my idea, uh, obviously. Uh and yeah, yeah, great, great. So you give them an idea and they're like, oh, can you change this? Can you change that? It's like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Fuck off. Forget it. You know, forget the whole thing. You know, no. I've done you a cover. It's fucking great. Shut the fuck up. Give me the money. <laughs> Use it. 
That's the thing. So, yeah, I only design for myself now. Yeah. I would also say you don't design for yourself. You always go into like merch. You've got your, your Valentine's Day cards that you brought out. Sort of yeah, way. I've got Val Valentine's Day cards, Valentine's Day cards, yeah. Father's Day cards. Uh, you know, I've got birthday cards. I've got Get Well cards. I've got Easter cards. I've got Thanksgiving cards. I've got t shirts, sweatshirts, prints. Yeah. 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 It's all, <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole crusher world out there. Are you displaying your artwork again at Bloodstock this year, mate? Uh, I'm not sure. I hope so, because I now have the Crusher Wall. Yeah. Uh, which is there for impaturity. Uh, and, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. That'd be cool. So, so what's the, the rest of the year hang on for you, mate? Obviously, you've got Bloodstock and Stone Dead, but have you got anything else lined up? No. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I might, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work myself up to doing some more. I want to do another T-shirt. I want to do another prostate cancer T-shirt, uh, which will say, Crusher says, do not linger, get the finger. Right? Uh, and I want to do, I want to do another birthday card. Uh, I want to get back to these cards again. I'm going to be doing some fuck. Crusher says fuck cancer patches and badges but uh, yeah I'm, I'm very very lazy these days unless I have to earn a bit of money you know I, I'm quite happy to sit at home fucking watching the television <laughs> well you need to rest after the years from 1977 to 1995 yeah 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 I'm still tough for fuck from by that seriously <laughs> still catching up on sleep mate probably yeah yeah <laughs> Oh, I tell you what, I will tell you. What's that? Um, uh, the Aussie thing. Yeah. I, I could have told you in fucking 2009. Well, I was telling people in 2019. That will never happen. Mm. That will never happen. I mean, just watching the videos of him and, and, and hearing him talking and stuff, you, you could just tell now this is it's not going to happen. But of course, Sharon wanted to fucking milk it. Yeah, and and, uh, and she has. I mean, God knows how many millions they've made off. You know, it's almost five years. You know, interest on a worldwide tour that was sold out. You know, those ticket sales making a lot of money in a bank somewhere. Yeah, I think, like you say, anybody who saw photos, videos of Aussie in the last five years yeah. would have yeah. seen that. You know, bless him, it was. He was way too far gone to come back from from the. He should have, he should have retired, fucking probably eight to ten years ago, um, you know. And and he deserved to. He deserves to. You know, I sincerely because I love Ozzy. You know, I don't have much time for Sharon, but I do love Ozzy, and he deserves to, to to retire. And I hope that he's left in peace to enjoy himself in retirement. But he won't. She'll have something up her fucking sleeve that he's got to go out and do. Poor bastard. Oh, you say anyway, on, on that note, you know, fuck them all. <laughs> I think that's a good note to end on, Crusher, buddy. Okay, mate. All right then, Lee. Till next time, rock hard, rock heavy, rock animal. Take care of yourself, buddy. Speak to you soon. Okay, bye.